And here we go. Hi, everyone. I hope you are having an amazing day. Thank you for joining us for this year's Wellness Week, and we hope you've been enjoying all the Wellness Week events in office. Joining us today is Vasavi Kumar. Vasavi is the outspoken host of the Say It Out Loud podcast, upcoming author of the Say It Out Loud book in spring 2023 keynote speaker and actress. As a first generation Indian immigrant, Vasavi made her parents proud by going to Columbia University to receive her second master's in social work. Through her Say It Out Loud group experience, one-on-one -on -one mentorship and corporate wellness trainings, Vasavi helps her clients to show up with clarity, intention, and confidence in all aspects of their life, starting with their inner dialogue. Now, please help me in welcoming Vasavi to Indeed. Thank you so much. You all know I was just like hiding back there, like listening to my intro. I first want to say thank you to the team who brought me here, Angela, Gabrielle, Graciela, Anna. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here for Wellness Week. Um, I was getting my hair done before this, okay? And the lady who was doing my hair, she was like, do you ever get nervous before you get on stage? And I said, um, I used to. I used to get really nervous before I got on stage because I'm an overthinker. Is anyone else here an overthinker? Yeah. So I used to be a really big overthinker and I would like try to figure out the exact right thing to say so that you know, I didn't come off as crazy, so that people understood me, so that I would make sense. And I've done a lot of work on myself and it is a lifelong journey. So the healing never ends, it feels like sometimes. It's like there's always stuff to keep peeling back. Um, but one of the things I said to my lady today who was, blowing, who, was, who was doing my hair, I go, to be honest, I'm not nervous. I'm actually very excited because this is the second time I've been on stage in front of human beings in the past three months. I'm so sick of virtual Zoom. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm so sick of Zoom meetings. I can't feel you. I don't know what you're wearing. What are you even doing? So it's just really beautiful to be up here and to be here with all of you because I think um, that's the point of life. I think we, we come into this world with so much love to give and then stuff happens, life happens and we start to shut down and close down the best parts of ourselves, And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm not nervous to be here. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm thrilled that I get to see human beings face to face again. So, oh, and by the way, today I'm going to be talking about um, coming back home to yourself, bringing all the parts of you together to show up as your best self. Hey, okay, there we go. Okay, so let's set some intentions. Um, my intention today is for you to walk away feeling inspired, jazzed up, motivated for you to bring more of yourself, not only to work, but also um, in your personal life. I'm going to be sharing a few stories today that have shaped who I am and the person that you see standing in front of you today. We may look different. We may come from different backgrounds. Um, but what I would love to just kind of plant that seed in your head is I would love for you to pay attention to the feeling of the story, right? Because I think that's the thing. We, we think we're so different from one another, but we're really not, right? So I might be sharing a story about whatever. I'll get to my stories. And you might be like, oh, that's never happened to me. But if we really tap back into our heart, what we'll find is we know what that feeling feels like. And that's what I really want is for y'all to get back to that feeling inside of you that we've always had that allows us to show up as our best self. Every part of you matters. I'm huge into parts therapy. I'm also a licensed therapist. So parts therapy is something that I got introduced to later on in my career. But my message here today is about honoring every, every single part of you, especially the ones that are like cringe and are messy. And you're like, ooh, I don't want anyone to know that about me. That's the part of yourself that needs love. I always tell people, I'm like, self-love is easy when your hair is done, when you're looking cute. Try loving yourself when you hate yourself. That's when the real work begins. And that's what this is really about is those parts of you that you've abandoned, those parts of you that you don't want anyone to see, that's where the magic is. That's where the gold is. And I'm going to get into some of the parts of myself that I hid and I abandoned and what I needed to do to reclaim that part of myself. I celebrate you in the fullness, in your entirety. You are worthy simply because you are, not because of what you do, but simply because of who you be. 
So I want you to stay open. I don't ever know if I'm going to see any of y'all again today. So let's just value and honor this time that we have together. And then I just want to take a moment to express my gratitude once again to Angela, Gabrielle, Graciela, um, Anna, who brought me here today. So let's also just say thank you to them. Let's just give them a little round of applause because without them, I would not be here today. Um, and I promise you this, like this is my number one commitment to you. Um, I will bring my best self to the table. That's, that's my always my number one commitment. Whatever I do, um, I don't like to half-ass anything. Like for me, if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna bring my whole self to the table because what's the point? What's the point of that, right? So here are three truths about me. My life has been a hot mess. I'm brilliant and I'm also very excited to be here. Um, these are things about myself that I wouldn't normally say out loud. I would never normally want people to know that my life has been a hot mess, but it has been a hot mess mess okay i'm also brilliant and that's something that i've also had to acknowledge i'm not necessarily brilliant in like a traditional indian way right like you know for indians we have to be good at science and math and like go to med school i have a mom who's a doctor my sister's a doctor my bro you get the picture i chose to get on stage and speak but we're all brilliant in our own way and that's really what cultivating all the parts of yourself is about it's about finding your brilliance okay so i own that that i am brilliant in my way um and like i said i am very excited to be here so um, when you hear something that resonates inside of you, whether you're here live or you're watching remotely, feel free to type it in the chat. When you hear something that I share and it resonates something inside of you like, ah, oh, I've been there before, just say it out loud. You can just tap to the person next to you. I get it. Like, right? Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, y'all are spending eight, nine, you know, maybe 10 hours a day at work. You're with, you're hanging out with all these people at work. We want to know that we're not alone wherever we go, right? So if you, if you hear something that I say, or if you've experienced something that I've been through, turn to the person next to you, say out loud to me, I get it because I want to know I'm not alone either. Okay. So just say, I get it. Or also type that in the chat. And we do this once again, to cultivate a feeling of connection and community. We walk around and especially social media has, I would say definitely attributed to this factor that we think that we are so different from one another, but we actually are not. So my unpopular opinion, number one, I have two, I have many actually, but for this talk, um, my first is that work should feel like home. I don't work for someone, I work for myself, but I believe that if you're gonna spend eight, nine, 10 hours at a, at a job, it should feel like home. Let me give you my definition of home. Home is a place where every single part of you is approached with a gentle and curious response, not a judgmental reaction. So the home that I'm speaking to is your inner home is the home that you feel inside of yourself. No matter whether you're with a group of people, whether you're here at work, whether you're by yourself watching Indian matchmaking on Netflix, anyone else? Oh, just me, Never mind. Okay, whether you're just at home watching your favorite show, I want you to feel at home within yourself because when you feel at home within yourself, you can step foot into work and it doesn't feel like you're this fragmented person, right? Like you bring yourself wherever you go. The best quote my mom, ever shared with me, and she probably, I don't think she made up this quote, but she always used to say to me, wherever you go, there you are, right? So I am an escapist, I, I used to be, I'd always be like, I need to go here to solve my problems. I need to go here, I need to go to India to solve my problems. And I've been going to India since I was a kid, but my mom always used to say to me, you don't need to go somewhere to go find yourself. You really don't like, yes, I believe in like taking breaks and taking little staycations or whatever, but the fact of, the, fact of the matter is, you are going to take yourself wherever you go. You're going to, you're like, whoever you, however you feel on the inside, that part is not going to leave you just because you go to a tropical island, right? So it's so important that we cultivate that inner home within ourselves. And that's my definition of home. Um, here's my second unpopular opinion. And let's just see. Okay. So I was originally going to name this talk about coming back to your authentic self. And then I realized that aiming for authenticity is a really bad idea. Here's why. And instead, I want you to aim for your best self. And I'm going to show you what those parts of your best self are. Let's just say I had a really bad uh, conversation, like just like a, like an awful conversation before I got here, right? Indeed is not paying me to come 
up here and tell y'all about my bad day. They're coming, they invited me here to motivate y'all to get back home within yourself. So if I was being authentic, I'd be like, guys, I had the worst day. You have no idea. No one cares. No one cares about my bad day, right? I am here for a reason, for a divine purpose. And that is to show up as my best self and to do the job that I'm here to do, which is to hopefully inspire, motivate, spark something inside of you to reclaim those parts of yourself that you've abandoned. Y'all get what I'm saying? Like why sometimes like being authentic all the time, it's like, oh, I'm just like, I'm just being real. It's like, no, you're being a jerk. You know what I mean? Like there's a fine line. So aiming for authenticity is a bad idea. And instead I would rather, I would encourage you um, to start seeking these parts of yourself that make up your best self. So the question that I just want you to think about throughout the next 50 minutes, and thank you for the clock, because I can talk so long and, and I, I literally will go over. So we have 50 minutes. So I, the question that I want you to think about while I'm up here is what parts of yourself do you need to welcome back home? Okay, like what are the parts of yourself that you know um, could use a little attention, could use a little bit of your focus and your energy, okay? So here are the six parts of your best self. I have come up with these six parts based on the stories in my life and what I have gone through in my life. And these six parts are uh, belonging, creativity, intuition, stability, compassion, self-expression, okay? Y'all ready? We're gonna, we're like gonna get into the story of my life, strap in. Okay, so part one, belonging. Um, those are my parents. They immigrated from India. Um, in 1974, um, that is them when they landed in New York. They had never experienced snow in their life. That is my sister and I with really white Cabbage Patch dolls because I don't think my dad knew to get us like melanin uh, color, color Cabbage Patch dolls, but that's okay. My dad's a really good father, so we're not gonna we're not gonna say anything about him. The story that I really want to share here is that um, you know in the second grade. I went to a pretty much all white town on Long Island, New York. And every year there was a contest and it was called the Reflections Contest. This was a, a, a writing contest and they gave the entire elementary school a writing prompt. So in the second grade, the writing prompt that we received was, does the sky, no, does the sky have a limit? That's what it was. Does the sky have a limit? And I so brilliantly responded with, the sky only has a limit if you believe it has a limit. And guess what? So here we were, it was like the end of the school day, like a week had passed by, I submitted my essay and they announced the winner of the reflections contest. And they said, Vasavi Kumar, it's Vasavi by the way. I didn't correct anyone about my last name until I was 18 years old, but that's not the point. The point is that was the first time I heard my name over the loudspeaker and I was so excited, right? Cause I was just a kid. I just won this context, this, this contest. I think I might've even won a gap card, like a gap gift card back in the day. So like that was a big deal. And I remember how excited I was that I won something, right? And then just hearing my name, like Vasavi Kumar, right? I was the only Indian in the entire school. And I was so excited and I was like, try, like just like extremely exuberant. That was me as a child. I mean, just look at my face. That's me, the little one right there. You can't even see my eyes. I'm so cute. And my dad used to cut my hair. I mean, it's like, a, I don't know why he needed to do that, but he did. But I remember being so excited and one of the girls in my class, I will not say her name, but if you want to ask me afterwards, I'll tell you her name. Uh, she said to me, who do you think you are? Oh, you think you're better than us now? That's what she said. I was so excited to win that contest. And she said to me, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us. So I made a decision in that moment. If I didn't want to get beaten up or if I, if I wanted to belong in the school with these people who clearly did not like me or they were like, who do you think you are? I said to myself, I'm never going to be too much. I'm never going to be too outspoken. I'm never going to show how smart I am. I'm never really going to show my excitement because it's going to scare people away. And then I'm not going to fit in. Can anyone relate to this in some shape or form with their, with their family, even at work in their personal life? I can't be too dot, 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 because then I'm not going to fit in or people may not understand me. Right. So that's a part of myself that split away. Right. And um, I had to come back home to it. This is how I came back home to it. I'm very clear on my core values, y'all, quality and knowledge, quality of my experiences, quality of my work, quality of my relationships, quality of communication, everything that I do, it, it has to be, it has to feel good. It ha I need it to be top 
quality, whatever it is, okay? And when it comes to knowledge, knowledge is the foundation of all my understanding upon which I learn about my intuition, my my creativity, my ideas. Just like I am, I love knowledge, right? Knowledge is power. Without it, like what, what, what are we even doing, right? Like I love to learn. I'm hungry for knowledge. So I came back home to a sense of belonging within myself by owning my values, my two core values, which is quality and knowledge. I also surround myself with a like-minded community of colleagues and friends. I've been in Austin for nine years. I'm originally a New Yorker and uh, I've been here for nine years. I have such good friends here. I have so such great colleagues here. And I'm just, I'm so happy to have friends that feel like family because my family's still on the East Coast. So even in your workplace, right? Start seeking out and and go outside your comfort zone too, right? Like there are friends that I'm friends with that I can't even believe that I, I would be friends with them because it, they just felt so different. They may felt different, but we have the same core values. We we all want quality of experiences, quality of relationship, and we all care about bettering ourselves, self knowledge, self growth, and just being better versions of ourselves. I also honor my energetic ebb and flow. How many of you are introverts posing as extroverts? Is that just me? Yeah, like I'll go out and do stuff. And I used to do this. I'd be like, I just push, 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 say yes to everything. I used to have massive FOMO, fear of missing out. Now I just have top-notch JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. So I'm, re I'm really, I am like, so okay with if I don't want to do something, I just don't do it. I, and it's it's not like, you know, um, I'm not suggesting that if you don't want to come to work, please don't go to work. You know, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is like, you know, just think about, think about the things that you have on your plate that really just don't need to be on your plate. Think about the yeses that you give to people that should actually be no. Think about in your family life. Think about in your friend life. Think about on a Friday night when you're actually just tired and your body just wants to you know, Netflix and chill or whatever, but you push yourself, you push yourself. And it's like, that is how I came back home to myself is that I honor my energy. Like after this, I'm not doing anything for the rest of the day because I'm giving it my all on stage. I am doing a 7 p.m. Uh, sleeping yoga class, which is basically, you, you, you know, the kind of yoga where you really don't do anything. You're just like on the floor. I'm doing that at seven and that's it. That's me honoring my energetic ebb and flow. And what I'm doing is that I'm saying to that part of myself that split away at a young age, I got you. I see you. I am no longer going to push you to try to fit in with every, everyone else. You do not have to change who you are to fit in. We are going to stay true to our core values. Got that? Hold on. I just have to. I'm very vain. I don't want to have shine on TV. Okay, there we go. I own that. I honor that. I, I honor the fact that I am hella vain. I don't want to have shine on my face. Okay, next, let's get to, um, let us get to creativity. Okay, so one of the ways that I learned to belong was to be the class clown. I'm actually quite funny in case you couldn't tell, but I did. I mean, in, in second grade for Halloween, my mom was like, what do you want to be for Halloween? And I said, I wanted to be a clown. That was the role that I played. I played the role of class clown because that was my way of fitting in, right? Like I couldn't be too smart because then the kids would make fun of me, right? I couldn't be too outspoken because they'd be like, who, who do you think you are, right? So I learned to be the class clown. That's how I learned to survive growing up. And when I think about this girl right here, that was me in the second grade, I think about how much energy she had and not knowing how to harness and channel that very creative energy. I never thought I was a creative person. And so if, if any of you have ever told yourself like, oh, I'm not creative, I want you to keep listening to this story. Um, I used to tell myself I'm not creative. I'm like all over the place. I'm like, I would just say all these things to myself or like there's something wrong with me. And I truly believe that we breathe life into our life. And what I mean by that is this, I thought for so long, there's something wrong with me. I'm broken. Uh, I need to be fixed. And so um, I went away to college and I had no idea what was in store for me because I grew up in a pretty sheltered home. My parents didn't really want me to do much. They didn't really let me go out much because they were you know, scared of what I was going to get into. And I was already getting into some trouble in high school. But when I went away to college, things just got really, really out of control. I went to uh, Boston University, uh, sophomore and freshman year, freshman and sophomore year. I transferred back home. Um, and I told my mom, having taken one psychology class, um, I think I have bipolar disorder. 
I actually said that to my mother. No, it's, it's actually true. It's not funny, actually, because I came back home and I said to my mom, I think I need to go to a doctor because everything that I was doing in college was very symptomatic of all the, um, all the characteristics that you see of people who struggle with bipolar disorder. And I was right. We went to one of the best psychiatrists in New York City, 59th and Lexington, Dr. David Ginsburg. And I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 19 years old. You might be wondering, why do you have a piece of cheesecake up there? Um, because after we were done with the doctor, my mom was devastated, obviously, because in the Indian community, and not just in the Indian community, but society in general does not really have a lot of compassion for people who have mental illness. Um, I dealt with it by getting a piece of strawberry cheesecake from the diner inside Penn Station. And so every time I think of strawberry cheesecake, it reminds me of that day where I felt such a relief that I was given this label. Because when I was given that label, here's the thing, I was acting and behaving in ways that were so far from who I knew I could be and who I knew myself to be. And so when I was given that label, I was like, oh, that's what's wrong with me. That's what's wrong with me. And I also just want to say, having perused the Indeed website, y'all have so many great resources like EAP, whether you're registered through Aetna or Kaiser, you guys have 24 seven counseling, like really great resources. And I just wanna say this as someone who has been through her, her own personal hell and back that there is absolutely no shame in asking for help. There's like, it takes so much courage to say, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need someone to help me. So I just wanted to, you know, shout out Indeed for having all these amazing resources for everyone here. So how, this is how I brought back my creativity. I allow myself to feel all my feelings unapologetically. I do, I used to struggle with emotional perfectionism. And so emotional perfectionism is like, okay, some emotions are okay, some emotions are not, right? Like, oh, it's, it's okay to be happy. It's okay to be um, um, upset about something, but it's not okay to be angry, right? Like we all struggle in our own way. For me, I used to uh, struggle with showing irritability and, and like showing annoyance. My, my mom was someone who was highly irritable growing up. It's the truth. She even admits it. She was a very busy doctor. She had her own private practice. So I struggled with like showing annoyance or like being like anytime I feel annoyed about something, I'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, it's okay. I would just kind of spiritually bypass that feeling. And I'd be like, no, we're not going to feel that. No, we allow ourselves to feel all of our feelings in a healthy way. And for me, if I'm angry, I will literally say out loud, I am pissed right now. I will allow myself to just move that through me instead of coping with substances, alcohol, and all sorts of stuff that just actually don't even help. They just make the situation worse. I also have released the need for perfection. Um, coming here and having created these slides, I haven't memorized what I'm gonna say. I just trust that God will move through me in the way it will move through me. My spirit will move through me. So I've just released the need to be this perfect human being because I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what it means to be a perfect human being. I just know what it means to be me. Right. Um, and I've also stopped expecting everyone to understand me because there are just going to be people that don't understand you. And that's like, that's so freeing just to just like be like, it's okay if you don't get me, I get me. Right. And that's why we need to come back home to ourselves because you stop needing everyone else to approve of you. You stop needing everyone else to get you because you get you. And so since I am the queen of saying it out loud, and I believe first and foremost that what you tell yourself dictates everything, I went from there is something wrong with me to every single part of me is worthy of my unconditional acceptance. Every single part of you. So like, think about the part of you that is most insecure. Think about the part of you that is shy, that you're like, oh, I hate this part of me. Or like, think about the part of you that may um, gossip a little bit. Think, just think about the qualities about yourself that you put down and you put down show that part a little bit of love because it needs your love. And here's the, here's the ultimate flex, okay? When you can unconditionally accept every single part of you, you stop needing it from everybody else, right? I don't need you to approve of this one part of me because I've already seen that part of myself. I love that part of myself. Whether you accept me or not is irrelevant because I accept that and that is ultimate freedom. It's a every, and by the way, it's a moment to moment choice. It is not like a, oh, I have arrived. Like, no, every single day, moment to moment, I have, I get to choose. Not I have to, I don't have to do anything. I get to choose how to love myself in those moments. How are we doing so far? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I love to hear that. Okay. 
I love validation. All right, part three, part three is uh, intuition. So I love this photo of me on the left. And I wanna encourage all of you in your workspace, at home, on your fridge, this photo of me, first of all, check out that blue romper. Oh my God, so cute. I keep this photo of me in my office right next to my laptop because I have a little bit of workaholic tendencies. And so I keep that photo next to me. So I remind myself to just chill and go play. And that little girl, I think I was about two and a half, three years old. I'm just so adorable. Like I can't even ha handle it, but that's what I really want y'all to do. Like go home, find a photo of you at like your absolute purest before life tainted you, right? Like before stuff happened, before life handed you, you know, a shit sandwich, but honestly, like you need to take that photo of you and you got to put it somewhere near you to remind you that there is a part of you that has always known the truth of who you are. And that, that part of you that has always whispered that deep truth to you, but oftentimes we ignore it. For example, in the story that I want to share here, um, I actually put a smiley face. That is my ex-husband, so you cannot see him. I want to be, I, I, I want to honor his privacy. I got married when I was 28 years old. I had a big fat Indian wedding. It was three days, 650 people, a lot of money. <laughs> way too much money that one person needs to spend on a wedding. Um, and I knew that I, I should not have gotten married. I got married at 28 because my sister was getting married three months prior. All my friends were like, wait a minute, y'all have been together for six years. Why aren't you guys, getting six, seven years, why aren't y'all getting married? And it's like, we're not getting married because I mean, I just, I felt pressured to be honest at 20, I'm 40 now. Um, I look 32. That's what you're all supposed to think and say. But uh, I knew at 28, like I knew I should not have gotten married. And I even said to my father, I said to my father a month before I got married, I really should not get married. Like I just, I just knew it. And my father, bless his heart. He didn't realize the impact of his words, but my father said to me, well, you have bipolar disorder. Who else is going to marry you? And, you know, he kind of had a point. And at that time in my life, I trusted my father more than I trusted myself. How many of y'all have ever outsourced your own intuition to other people who aren't living in your body, who don't have your lived experience? I love my father, but even to this day, I'm like, that was the worst advice you ever gave me. You, I could have saved you $350,000, seriously. So this is how I've come back home to my intuition. Number one, I have forgiven myself for all the times that I went against my intuition. And there were many times that I went against my intuition. I just knew when I shouldn't have dated that guy, when I shouldn't have taken that client on, when I shouldn't, you just know it. And I forgave myself because that was stopping me from continuing to, to, to deepen that trust with myself because I was shaming myself. You're not gonna get anywhere in life by shaming yourself. It's like the lowest feeling ever, right? I mean, so you gotta, you really gotta just forgive yourself and just be like, say sorry to that part of yourself that didn't know any better, okay? I stopped outsourcing my wisdom. I stopped asking everyone for feedback. And instead I just took the time to get really quiet and go within and just ask myself, what is it that I really want, okay? And the third thing, and I think this is probably the most important, is the body first, mind second. Um, you know, growing up in the Indian community, we, I mean, as women especially, like my mom, I mean, she didn't know any better, but she'd always be like, you know, cover up your body because you don't want men to look at you or this or that. So like from a very young age, and I think women deal with this a lot, is like, we, it's, it's almost like we should, we need to be afraid of our own bodies. Like we're so, we're, we're just taught that our bodies are like bad or like it's our fault if something happens. So I really got disconnected from my body at a very young age. So even if my body was trying to tell me something, I didn't know. I wasn't connected to it, right? So now I do not, um, I don't go with my mind. I always go with like, what's that initial feeling? And then my mind follows. I always listen to that gut feeling for a reason. I use my mind to execute. That's it. I am not going to go to my mind to make life altering decisions. I'm not going to consult with my mind because my mind is always going to be like, well, what about this person? What about that person? What should you do? No, I'm always going to listen to my body because my body will never lie to me. And so I went from saying like, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, no, you do know. You just, you're not tapped into it. Right. So don't believe those lies. So when your mind tells you, I don't know, you do know. Um, and instead I can never make the wrong decision when I'm truly listening to myself. And I fundamentally believe that my mom, 
as hard as she is, she said to me today, just speak from your heart when you're up there. I'm like, when did you become so soft? But it's so true though. It's like, you cannot make the wrong decision for you when you are truly listening to yourself. Even the things that you're like, oh, I made a mistake. Did you really, or did you learn from that? And did you grow from that, right? So just remember that as long as you're listening to yourself. And by the way, easier said than done. I'm not gonna sit up here and be like, it's so easy to listen to your intuition. No, because you might piss off a few people, right? By you just choosing what you want, there are going to be people that's like, hey, what about me? What about like, no, but what about you, right? You come into this world alone, like you, you gotta look out for yourself. No one's coming to fix, save or rescue you, right? You gotta be the one to look out for yourself. And I wanna, I just wanna say that it is easier said than done. And it's an everyday moment to moment choice. I'm doing great with time, by the way. I'm very proud of myself. Okay, so part four is stability. Okay, so that's me and my dad. He he loved to rock the thick mustache. Love my father so much. He currently has um, atypical Parkinson's. It's called supranuclear palsy. It's a rare neurological condition. So my dad is uh, is the reason why I play tennis. He's the reason why I'm just so charming because he just you know he just he was such a lover of people and he still is. Um, but his speech has slowed down and uh, he can't really move without any help. And it's been very you know deteriorating to watch. Um, I love my father. His name is Shanti, but um, he was he was truly my stable, safe haven growing up. My father was the kind of guy who was very consistent. He, we, he, he never like yelled at us. He never hit us. That was my mom's job. Uh, my, my, my father was a very consistent man. And I felt very emotionally safe with my father. I knew that I could go to my father for anything and he was predictable. And that made me feel safe. The problem was when I got older, I didn't know how to create that and cultivate that safety and stability within. So I tried to, I never thought I had daddy issues, y'all. I had daddy issues because I tried to find my dad in all the men that I was dating, starting from my husband to the next relationship to the next. I was trying to find that stability and that security through a man because that's what I had growing up. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the best radar, right? Because I was not connected to my body, even though I could feel the red flags. I didn't really pay attention to them because my mind was like, no, give them a chance, right? This is why we got to be connected to our body. Um, and because of these unstable relationships that I was in, and I'd love for you to maybe, if you can, bring to your conscious mind uh, an unstable period in your life. For me, these pink handcuffs, by the way, APD uses pink handcuffs when you get arrested. I should know because I did get arrested in 2017. It was the most unstable period in my life. Um, I was dating a guy who was an addict and then I became an addict as well. I'm not three and a half years sober from cocaine. Thank you, y'all can clap. Cocaine is one hell of a drug to stop using, but I got arrested. Uh, we got into an altercation in 2017 and that was the most unstable period of my life. Um, I like I. I, I mean, that, that happened five years ago and um, I got banned from Airbnb. Airbnb it was like, I don't even know how that happens. I was just like, all right, I made a mistake five years ago. Can you all give me my Airbnb privileges back? But my point is, is that whatever you're going through in your life, and if you're going through something unstable, this is how you get back home to consistency, okay? And this is what works for me. And let me tell you this, as a Taurus, I keep things so simple. I do not like to complicate morning routine, evening routine. I keep things really simple. I go to sleep at the same time. I wake up at the same time. I exercise six days a week and I set boundaries and I walk away from toxic people, places, and things. Once again, easier said than done. I am not for canceling people. I don't think we need to get rid of people. I don't think, I mean, unless someone is actually harming you, I don't, I, for me, I don't do these like extreme, like I'm just gonna cancel you and never talk to you again. I limit my time. That's it. I limit my time and my energy. I love my mother, but like eight minutes is our max. When we're on the phone, it's like, love you, bye. Like we just end on a, on a high note, right? But it really does boil down to this. When I talk about consistency and I talk about, the time that you wake up and go to sleep and exercising. This is about rebuilding trust with yourself. After I went through that extremely unstable period in my life, and this is like, once again, this is a daily, this is a daily process. This is not just like a one-time thing. It's an everyday thing for me because I have broken so much trust with myself. Like there is this little girl inside of me. You've seen all these photos of me. There's this little girl inside of me that I've had to make amends to. And I've had to say, I am so sorry for putting you in harm's way. I'm so sorry for hurting you. She's the one I need to apologize. 
to. She's the one that I have to prove myself to, nobody else. So we go to sleep at a certain time. We wake up at a certain time. We work out. When we're tired, we take a break. We eat healthy. It's rebuilding trust with yourself. For those of you who get a little nervous about being consistent because you think it's going to make you boring, let me just tell you right now, there is magic in the mundane, okay? You got to find the magic in just the mundane. I love just having a routine because I look at consistency as like this, um, this beautiful structure. And within that structure, I get to flow, right? The reason why I have the freedom that I have both internally and in my life is because I created a safe container for me to operate in. And that looks like my wake, my sleep, my exercise, um, working out first thing in the morning has been a game changer for me when I talk about body first, mind second. Um, if I had not really started to pay attention, you know, getting back um, into my body, I don't think I would be where I am today, which is at a place where I feel so safe inside of myself. And so even when I'm around people, I can feel them. I can, I can, I can feel other people now because I can feel myself again. Cause we're all just like, energy beings walking around. You know, you could just feel someone, you can just walk into a room. Okay, hold on. Thank you so much for, okay, we're good. We're good, we still have plenty of time. Okay, and this, these, um, I wanna say this about consistency and what this has to do with succeeding. I was, and feel free to admit this if this is you, because there's no shame. I, like, I was the only person standing in my own way. I was so afraid of succeeding go back to the second grade, right? Because what happened last time I won a contest? No one, no one was happy for me, right? Everyone's like, who do you think you are? So me, I was the only person getting in my own way and I would stop and I would start and I would stop and I would start and I was my own saboteur, right? But by being consistent and building that trust with myself, I now know like there's nothing to, for me to be afraid of. It, I, am, I used to be so scared of succeeding. Why? Go back to that second grade story. Kids won't like me. I'm going to outshine everyone. People are going to think I'm arrogant. I'm going to be lonely. You can't really be lonely if you're happy with yourself. You know what I mean? I'd rather be alone and by myself than be with someone who doesn't appreciate me, right? So I'm very, I'm very content in my solitude. And that is what consistency and creativity and all the stuff that we've been talking about has helped me to get to this point. Um, and now, you know, and, and also... I want you to think about even in your work life, maybe you wanna go for uh, a promotion. Maybe you want to take lead on a project that you've been scared of doing. You're like, oh, I'm not good enough. Like this is like all the stuff that we're talking about will help you internally feel more confident to ask for that raise, ask for that promotion, to be put on lead of a project. I, mean, I don't know if I'm using the right lingo, but you all know what I mean. Like you can grow. It is safe for you to move forward. It is safe for you to shine. It is safe for you to keep climbing the ladder, whatever it is that you wanna do. Um, but it really does boil down to building that trust with yourself and finding that um, place of home within yourself to do so. Um, so that's why Clef Sean, are you, are you guys familiar? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna get to that story in a sec. Okay, so that's my mom and I. I love her. I do love my mom, okay? She's, I'm, I'm still terrified of my mother at the age of 40. Is anyone else? Okay, me too. Okay, great. So yeah, <laughs> she, no, she, no she, she's wonderful. She's just a tough cookie, you know? She's, I mean, she came here um, with my father and she, you know, she's a female doctor, owned, opened up her own practice. She had to be tough. And she is a uh, tiger mom in a way. You know, she was just very much like, um, she smothered us a little bit, you know, but she cared. She really did care a lot. Um, very compassionate um, in her own way. She had a very uh, interesting way of showing her compassion, but I had to learn how to be the mother to myself. I had to learn how to be the father to myself, right? And I truly believe that we can, we can be the parents to ourselves that we didn't receive growing up. And um, that's our job and it's our responsibility to reparent ourselves. And um, this is me and Wyclef John. I was a co-host of uh, a morning show here in Austin, Texas. This was my last show that I did. I booked Wyclef John to come on for South by Southwest. This was in uh, 2019 and I got let go that day actually. And so after that day, I, I went to rehab. I, I, I've been in rehab twice. Um, I kind of missed over that, I skipped over that part, but I was back in rehab for the second time. This was in March of 2019. And so one of the things that I realized, so I went back into rehab. This is the same place that I'd went to the first time in 2017. And I remember the counselor everyone actually in the rehab center here in Austin, they were like, Vasavi, it's so great to see you. Welcome back to rehab. And I was like, wait, 
I don't want to be known for this. Like, this is not why God put me on this earth to be known for being an addict. You know what I mean? So I made a decision that day when I went back to rehab the second time. I asked my counselor, Carl, though, that was there. And I said, what do I need to do, Carl, to never come back to rehab again? And he said to me, I need you to stop acting like you know everything. And I need you to just listen to us and do what we tell you to do, which was very hard for me because I was someone that was like, don't tell me what to do. I really rebelled against authority. But the fact of the matter is I clearly didn't know what I was doing because I was back in rehab, right? So I had to learn how to love myself. And I had no idea how. In fact, I had no idea how to love myself that I actually Googled how to love myself. And one of the first things that they said was hydrate first thing in the morning. So that I was like, okay, that's what I did. I actually learned, like, I didn't know what it meant to love myself. I always thought that I was so complicated to love because the people in my life had made me feel like I was complicated to love. The thing that I want to say now that I, I, I'm like, I'm just blown away. It's like, it's like I'm so easy to love just the wrong people didn't know. Like it was just the people, like people didn't know how to love me. I had to learn how to love myself. And so it's a beautiful process to learn how to love yourself the way that you need to be loved. And there's, there's no such thing as it's too late. There's no such thing as, oh, you're too old. None of that. I'm 40 and it's like, I'm just getting started. All right. So um, I, this is how I came back home to compassion. I asked for what I want. Always, you can ask Angela, you can ask, you can ask Graciela. I was very clear with them on Zoom exactly what I needed and we had a great conversation. I asked for what I want. And I also don't accept no for an answer. I really don't, I'm very determined. And I'm like, okay, if, if, if you're gonna say no, I'll find another way or I'll just go somewhere else. I just don't give up on myself like that. I don't give up on myself at all with anything anymore. And I don't believe in losses, only, le only lessons. I don't believe in losing. I believe that with everything that happens in our life, so think about all the things in your life that have happened that maybe is hard for you to let go of. And if you can extract the lesson, you can be like, what did I actually learn from this? How has what I've been through helped me to become who I am today? That's the, that's the shift, right? It's not like, oh, this happened to me. Like I can easily be like, guys, no one liked me growing up. I had bipolar disorder. I have this mental illness that I was diagnosed with. I got, no, thank God all those things happen. You know what I mean? And like, if, if I'm going to be really honest with you, no, I'm not really grateful for all that stuff. I mean, I, I went through hell, right? But I'm grateful for who I've become as a result of it. Okay, so having gratitude for the things that you've gone through. And if you look at everything in your life as a learning opportunity to understand yourself on a deeper level, there's no such thing as any losses. And so I went from saying, I'm not good enough. I'm, I think we all struggle with that in some shape or form, worth issues, shame issues. And instead of I'm allowed to make mistakes, I'm human. I think I've made a few mistakes while I'm up here, but I don't even know what that means, right? I'm just human. I'm just talking to y'all, right? So am I really making a mistake? I don't know. But if I did, I'm allowed because I'm human. And lastly, um, the, I'm so good with time. Okay, we have like 19 minutes. Okay, so um, part six is self-expression. This is probably my, this is probably my most favorite part. Let me tell you why. Because when you really focus on finding that sense of belonging within yourself, honing it and just, and just allowing yourself to be creative and not be so logical about everything all the time. Allow yourself to play like a child when you allow yourself to start you know, deepening that trust within yourself, your intuition. What else did I say? What did I say after intuition? Uh, I don't remember. What did I say after intuition? Okay, those are the two things. Stability, compassion, okay? The stability, compassion. When you make that an active daily practice in your life, you will become more self-expressed. So on the left is a commercial that I was recently in for the domestic abuse organization. By the way, this commercial is gonna be aired in the White House this month in front of Joe and Kamala and Reese Witherspoon. So like, that's one way that I express myself. I was recently on the cover of Austin Woman Magazine in May of 2022, which, which is my 40th birthday month. And that was me being a keynote speaker. I'm also a voiceover artist. I'm, I, I narrate audiobooks. I do all sorts of fun stuff, animation, gaming, cartoons, all of that stuff. But I allow myself to do what I want. If something seems fun for me, I just do it. I'm starting karate on Monday night. Who does that? I do because I used to take karate when I was a kid and my sister used to like, you know, karate chop me and then I like just quit on myself, but I'm taking karate starting Monday night. Super excited about that. I just allow myself to do what I want, right? So the way that I do that and come back to my version of self-expression, self I trust my curiosity. If I'm curious about something, I trust it. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna go do it, right? Like my girlfriend just, she was texting me. She goes, you wanna go wake surfing? I'm like, 
oh, that sounds fun. Cool. I'm going to go do that in two weeks, right? I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. That's why I'm writing a book called Say It Out Loud. I'm very intentional about the words that I use. If you notice that I take pauses, which I haven't paused much, I can talk. <laughs> I can talk. But I, I, I always want to think before I say, where is this coming from? Is this coming from fear? Is this coming from needing to protect or defend myself? Is this coming from just the, the, the most honest expression of how I actually feel? How do I say what I want to say in a way that honors my experience, honors my dignity, and also honors the dignity of another human being? And lastly, I'm honest with myself for, first and foremost. You don't get and stay sober by lying to yourself, right? So I have to be honest with myself. I'm honest with my friends. I let them know if I'm going through something. I'm just honest with myself because secrets keep us sick. Right. For any of us who grew up in dysfunctional homes where, you you know, maybe your parents would fight, but they'd be like or like they uh, tell you about one parent and then say, OK, but don't tell your dad I said this. That is so unhealthy. It is so unhealthy to keep those secrets and keep that stuff inside of you, because for you to truly show up as your best self, you got to keep your this is I, I consider us like this form that we're in, this is our creative channel, right? And in order for those ideas to move us, move through us, in order for our spirit to move through us, whatever that looks like for you, God, universe, spirit, we got to keep ourselves clean. We got to keep ourselves clean. I don't just mean like taking a shower, do that too, please. But like inside, like we don't need that drama. We don't need that gossip. We don't need that resentment. Say it out loud, get it out of you. Get mental health counseling. There's nothing wrong with that. Take advantage of the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program. There are lots of also IRG groups as well. And like find your people, right? Find your people, talk to people. You will find out that you're not alone. And honestly, the way that I've been able to get to where I am is I've been in a lot of support groups. I've had to, I've had to in order to really work through like, huh, how does a girl go from like growing up in a really, you know, pretty much like, good home environment like I was given everything right like it wasn't the most ideal I don't think anyone any of us had a perfect childhood but how did I go from that to end up being in rehab twice like what went wrong here right and so I had to really process a lot of my stuff and I had to understand what I was not allowing myself to say what I was holding back in what was the pain that was not being expressed and part of that has looked like for me I'm back in therapy and I'm a therapist too listen we're the most toxic Therapists, I mean, we go into a profession where we have to help other people with their stuff. Trust me, we have issues too. Absolutely. So I'm back in therapy again, and we're really work, we're actually doing EMDR, which is to help release a lot of the uh, stored emotions and triggers and memories, and we're like neutralizing it. I'm just I'm I'm going back in therapy again, and I'm starting from scratch again. It's starting from scratch, meaning I've taken off my therapist hat. I'm going in as the patient, and I'm saying I need to work on this, this, and this. There's nothing wrong. There's no shame. I don't care how high up on the ladder you are in this company or wherever you are. Everyone needs someone to talk to. Okay. And if you don't, you can always talk to the voices in your head. And that's why we say it out loud. My entire book that I'm writing, which will be out next year is about learning to talk to every single part of you. And so when it comes to your self-expression, you go from, oh, I can't do that to no, who I be matters just as much as what I do. And let me tell you what that means. I realized as I was writing my book, um, I'm not the best writer. I'm really not. I'm not even the best speaker. I'm not. I'm not the best actress. I'm not the best voiceover artist. But people love being around me because of my energy. My energy is infectious. I'm a love bug. What I say, I mean what I mean. I say, I'm honest. You're always going to know that I'm fully present with you. You don't have to be the best at what you do. If you want to be, that's fine. If you want to be like LeBron, Kobe, or Serena, that's absolutely fine. But it's not so much about what you do. So whatever it is that you want to do, instead of telling yourself, I can't do that, focus more on how much fun you're going to have. And the thing that you want to do that you don't think that you can do will be so much fun just because you just put yourself into it, right? So allow yourself to just be the person that you want to be by following those feelings in your body that are like, oh, I should try that. Let me, let me, let me check that out, right? And so I want to go back to what home is. A home is a place where every single part of you is approached with a gentle and curious response, not a judgmental reaction. So like today when you're driving home or, you know, when you're by yourself and you're kind of reviewing your day, or maybe something happened today that kind of threw you off either at work or, you know, with your friends or whatever, be curious with yourself and actually ask yourself out loud, what's going on? Talk to me. Think about how you talk to a best friend. 
Think about how you would advise a colleague. We are so good at giving great advice to everybody else. I get paid to do that for a living. Yes, and guess what? We can be that person for ourselves. In fact, I'll be so bold to say that we are the ones to do that for ourselves. No one can heal you but yourself. Yes, you can have people in your life that support you. I have tons of people and support in my life that support me, but at the end of the day, I'm with me all the time, all the time. So we got to learn how to be with ourselves and find a, a, a sanctuary within our ourselves, in our, in our home. And so these are just some of the um, IRGs that are available in Indeed. We have Black Inclusion, Parents and Caregivers. Y'all have so many resources. I'm like, should I just work at Indeed? This is amazing. No, y'all have so many resources. And so what I would love, just like a quick action step for y'all, like maybe this weekend you can think about it. Like think about going through your insurance and seeing like maybe setting up a counseling session, maybe just having someone that you can talk to. Check out one of these groups. I didn't, I didn't put all of them on here because I just like, couldn't position them, but there are so many resources for y'all here at Indeed. And I just think, you know, it's such a beautiful place that you can actually heal. Imagine if work didn't have to be a place where you're like, I hate everyone. And actually you're at, you're, you're in a place of work where, you know, your company's actually helping you do that internal work so that you can perform as your best self at work, right? So take advantage of all these resources. I mean, I was reading through everything and I was just kind of blown away. I was like, I would be a part of the Asian network. Like I would, I, I would do that. Like I would, I would want to be involved with that, you know, and, or, or even, or even women at Indeed and just getting to know other people and knowing that you're not alone. And that's how work can feel like home and showing up as your best self. Once again, it's not about being perfect. It is not about like being the best, like it, it's not about it's what, what you're doing. It's about you really cultivating those six parts of yourself, even outside of work, right? Like you're here for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. But when you go home, how are you cultivating those parts of yourself? What are the things that you're doing to, to keep you feeling good and fun? So you're not like, oh man, I really don't want to go to work. I don't know if, if any of you think that way. I'm just like acting right now. But what I'm saying is like, you know, when, when you're not at work, what are you doing to cultivate those parts of yourself? Because you spend time here every day, right? So it's really important that you cultivate those six parts of yourself so you can show up as your best self. Thank you. Thank you. And then also for those of you who are on Instagram, you can follow me at my name is Vasavi. If you are interested, my book will be coming out for pre-order, um, vasavikumar.com forward slash book. And if you're a podcast listener, my podcast is Say It Out Loud. And I kept it on here. We're going to go to Q&A time. And look at this. There's still nine minutes to spare. I'm so proud of myself right now. Thank you so much. I know I already followed you on Instagram. <laughs> yes, you do. You do. So, wow. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. I could have slowed down. It's <laughs> nine minutes. I feel like I needed to hear that. Good. I, this is a reminder for me. Yeah. To find my home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm like <laughs> blotting away. It's like, no, thank you. Wait, sorry, I hear more about my sweat than what you're saying. Sorry, I, that's not uh, even true. No, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I always just want to share the truth and uh, my truth, and hopefully that'll resonate with someone else, you know? I have a uh, few questions mm -hmm. that were submitted for you. Okay. So the first question is, what has been your favorite part of the process? So the favorite part of the process is, I'm a very visual person. Um, even like, even before I came here, right? I like laid on my couch yesterday and I visualized parking here. I visualized walking in. I visualize getting on stage. I visualize standing up here. And so I have to see it in my mind first and then have it come to life. So throughout this whole process, I can say this now, like while I was in the thick of it, it was hell. I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I don't want to learn how to love myself. Can someone else just do the job of loving me? But the part that I love the most is to really like have this idea or this vision of what I want to feel and then bringing that to life. It's like, oh, I'm going to get myself flowers or, oh, like evening time used to be really lonely because I am single now. I'm not really ready to mingle at all. So no one come ask me out. It's not happening. But like, you know, nighttime used to be really difficult for me because I'd get lonely. And now my evening time is the most fun for me because I enjoy taking a nice shower, making a nice meal, watching Real Housewives of New Jersey if I want to, right? So it's like what I have like learned how to love myself through the through the periods of time where I actually felt very alone. Yeah. And bringing that to life. Yeah. 
Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I have my husband, but I want to tell you that the best dates are dates with myself. Yes. 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 So yes. totally get that. Yes. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like no. we are actually better partners when we can find happiness within ourselves. Then we're not trying to have our partner make us happy. You don't need <laughs> someone to make you happy. You want to come. You want to come happy. You want to come full, right? And then be able to serve from your overflow. That's beautiful. Next question. Um, did you ever feel lonely throughout the process? And how did you overcome that? 100% I felt lonely. Are you kidding me? Like I, I used to, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be dark here, but I'm going to be dark. Like I come from a family where we have suicide in our family. I've never attempted, but I've thought about it plenty of times in my loneliest of days. I'm like, what is the point of all of this? Thank God I, I, I had the grace of God always. So I never actually followed through with that, but it's been really lonely. Um, but that's where the work is. The work is when you're feeling lonely, not to reach for that drink, not to reach for that drug, not to reach for that ex who sucks. You know what I mean? Like you cannot do like, you know, not to reach for stuff outside of you. And it really is. How do I, how do I, how do I want to treat myself when I'm lonely? Right. It's, 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 it's a very empty feeling. And it's like, I'm invisible. Nobody sees me, but that's when you get to like, those are the moments where you get to love yourself. You know, I can say this now. I say this now in retrospect, but in, you know, like a few months ago, even a few years ago, it was hard. It was really hard. It was. Thank you for yeah. sharing. Next question. Uh -huh. um, how did you figure this out on your own? Um, were there any mentors or people, places, things that guided you? Yeah, I did not do this alone. I, I mean, no, I'd be lying to my teeth if I said I did this alone. I have my mother, my father, and you know, I, I don't rely on them because my dad is getting older. My mom's taking care of my father. I don't want to burden her with, too, I mean, she's just, you know, and they're on the East coast. I have my sister. I have my friends. I work out. I love group workout classes because I am super lazy and I will not go unless I put money down and I'm going to get charged. If I'm can if I cancel, I have a therapist. I, I, like I said, I have friends, I have colleagues. Like I, I'm an external processor. I'm not someone that's like, I just need to process alone. Like sometimes I do that and there's nothing wrong, but like in order for me to feel like I'm not crazy for feeling the way I feel, I have people that I talk to and I don't have a ton of friends. I have a small group of friends, but they're people who are like ride or die for me. Yeah. Thank you. And that's a good reminder that it's okay to seek help. And yeah, you know, absolutely. Like I just, we live in a culture where it's like, do it alone and toughen up. And it's like, <laughs> absolutely not. I've been doing that. That's why I'm here in the first place. Like it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. And often what ends up happening is we end up um, seeking connection with people who aren't qualified to give us anything. I so, agree. Yeah. I will open it up to everyone else. If anyone has any questions, yeah. um, Gabby or Angela will pass around the uh, yeah. microphone. You can ask anything. We we have a lot of time y'all, so let's, yeah. I've got a 15 year old and like, it's really tough, I think for them to find themselves and their home. Like, do you deal with teenagers and do you have any suggestions for, you know, going through this kind of process with them? Cause I find they just, they're always questioning themselves. I don't know if that they're too young to think about it, but yeah. I always feel like I, I want to help them, you know? Absolutely. I remember being a teenager and my mom was just terrified that I would end up being like all the kids at school. And in a way I, I kind of was, I just kind of chose friends that weren't, uh, you know, didn't have similar values. What I would say, first of all, I love the book Conscious Parenting by Dr. Shefali. She's great, but I don't have children. But what I do know how I wish my mother would and my mother and father would have been instead of um, kind of shutting me up. I, you don't seem like that. You seem like you're actually very curious with your kids. I would actually get really curious about with your kids and just talk to them. Like kids just need a place. I know this, like, I just wish I had someone who would have listened to me. That's what I wish. It's like, I, I mean, I could have maybe come to the answer sooner. I mean, my path is what it is. I don't regret it. But I would say with my mom, instead of her just telling me what to do, I wish she would have sat there and asked me more questions about myself and what interests me. Yeah. Like just really be genuinely curious and she was so fearful that I would turn out to be in a way that she, you know, was scared of. And I ended up turning out that way anyway, for a little bit of my time. And, you know, by the grace of God, I'm out of it now, but I would, I, I wish she would have listened more and talked less, to be honest, like just really ask me because like, it's all there inside of us, no matter if they're 16 or 35, like we, we all have that part of us that we can access. It doesn't matter how old we are. Like, even when we're kids, we know, even when we're children, we know that, but 
you know, we have adults in our life who think that they know better than us, but it's like, I, I think if we spent more time really listening to what people are saying, we can guide them to their truth. It's not our truth, it's their truth, right? But I know sometimes as parents, we can have our own agenda because we're so fearful of our kids turning out a certain way, but that actually causes more harm than good. And I, I feel like the best gift that anyone can give anyone, mom to kid or, you know, just friends or relationship is actually care, like actually care and actually be curious and like be willing to keep digging and digging and digging and have your kids be more self-reflective and learn to, and like teach them to trust themselves more. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any question? We got about two minutes. Coming at you. We actually have a full 90. No, 30, I think. 30. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I hate speaking of mics. Um, so it seems like you have like a lot of stuff that you do. I'm wondering how you get over the fear of putting things out that aren't perfect, like the perfection kind of uh, yeah, mindset to where you just that's put it out a, there. That's a great question. Uh, I, I actually just want to think about that real quick because I, I do it, it, I just do it kind of naturally, but let's just see how I do it. You know, it really is, when I put something out, I know where it's coming from. You know, it's like, I, I'm very clear on when I put something out there and it's not perfect. If you, if y'all follow me on Instagram, like I don't always have the best lighting. I'm sometimes in my part, in my, in my target pajamas. I think I might've had like a boob almost hanging out the other day. I was like, oops, I don't care. Like, because here's my thing is like, I'm very clear that when I put something out into the world, it's coming from the most pure place ever. Right. It's coming from like, you know, whatever it is, whether it's my writing or my videos or a podcast episode or whatever it is, like, I'm clear on where I'm coming from. And so for me, anyone can have an opinion about me, but I know myself, right? So, and I've also, I've spent so much of my life needing to be liked by other people. I'm done. I'm just, I'm over it. I'm just, I'm tired. I'm, I don't know, something happened when I turned 40. I'm like, I don't care anyone. I don't care what anybody thinks. But what I would say is it, it, it's like a muscle, right? Like it, and I used to be quite the perfectionist. Like I'd be like, oh, I can't say that. People might get offended. Or I would have that. Talk. I, I don't want you to think I just like woke up like this, you know? It really is a muscle though. It's like, whatever your art is, like, what is your thing that you want to put out? Uh, like woodworking mostly I make bowls and things like that but I like people always ask me like do you sell it I'm like no but I have like 150 yeah you should okay this is what I would do uh, if you if you have 150 pieces like I would literally post a photo every single day and like let people know what it is tell the story behind it people love stories like get connected to your stuff whatever it is like if you have a cool salad bowl like talk about what made you made that like people care about stories and here's the other thing I said this in the very beginning of my slides, like, you know, this is my divine purpose. If you look at what you do as like, that's God working through you or your creative spirit or whatever you want to say, it's not about me anymore. It's not about me. Like I'm here for the people. And I, I had to get through all of this stuff to actually be able to say this. I wouldn't have been able to say this like a year ago, even two years ago, but like, think about how happy someone's going to be when they get your wood stuff. So it's like, don't make it about you, make it about somebody else. But you know, you can still be gentle to that part of yourself that's like, listen, I know you're nervous, you blah, 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 whatever, but like people are going to be like, just talk to that part of you that's scared of screwing up or looking whatever. But I will say I attach everything to a story, right? You see my entire talk. I, I had stories for everything. So like whatever your wood pieces are, I would go home this weekend. I would go through all your wood stuff and I would literally just put little post-its like what inspired this? What inspired this piece? What inspired that piece? And share that because at the end of the day, people fall in love with your stuff not like they don't care about you no offense it's it, it's the story behind the thing you know but like bring like bring your heart into it you know just bring your heart into it and and just put it out there you uh, you said you had 150 pieces of that's ballpark i don't know that's a lot and that, that's a six months worth of stuff yeah like six months worth of stuff yeah just put it out and like you know get i mean like tap back into the passion of it like do you like doing it do you have fun doing it so like, talk about it like it's fun because you like, I can't do that. I mean, I, I would love a salad bowl, right? Like bring your fun into it. And like, that's infectious, right? Like, like I said, I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best. I mean, but my, but I have fun when I'm up here and I'm just like cracking jokes and I, but I'm still talking about really dark stuff, you know? So it's like, just bring your, bring you into it. And like, wherever you go, like let people like, let people know what's up, you know, talk about it. Just do that every single day. 
do that every single day. Yeah. Yes. Don't try. Do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to answer it. I feel like it's broad. Okay. But I'm always, I think, like right now in my career, just like looking. Yeah. I don't know like what it is that I'm like good at and stuff. So I'm like just searching and I feel like I'm not really getting anywhere. So, like, I guess, like, how do you navigate through that? Yeah. Yeah. I would say this when you're feeling stuck in something that you're trying to find the answer to. So like, for example, oh, I'm trying to find a career, but I, I, you know, like a new career path and I don't know what that is. I do this with any artistic project, right? If I'm getting frustrated, like for example, with my manuscript, I was writing it and I was like, what am I even trying to say? And I was getting so frustrated. So I walked away, I went swimming. I I did something else to shift up my energy, right? And then I came back and then I was able to sit down and work on my manuscript. So with you, with the job search, let's say it's a job search and you're getting frustrated, stop, walk away, do something that's going to lift your energy up, do something that's going to make you feel really good and confident. And then from that place, start searching for your job and just be open, like be willing to stretch and do something that you've never done before and say, just, and start to put on that. Hmm, what if I did this? Ooh, this sounds fun. Like instead of what's going to pay the bills. And I know that's important. And I'm not saying that's not, but like start looking for, this is fun. Oh, this feels like fun. Like follow the fun. So anytime I'm frustrated with anything, I don't try to like bang my head against it. I walk away, I shift up my energy, I come back and then I have a new perspective. So I would try that when it comes to your job search. And then also be willing to try something completely weird. Like go for the thing that you think your family's going to think you're crazy for doing, right? Like if that's usually the thing that you should be doing is the thing that you're afraid um, of people judging you for doing. That's what oh, I would say. That's you. a great question. Any other questions? Yes, fellow Indian in the house. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Vasavi. First of all, great presentation. And Thank you. Uh, I did resonate on many topics as you're presenting. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a question um, on the topic of intuition and you shared about gut feel and sometimes I find myself in situations where my gut feel says choice A and then there is the logic side of my brain that builds this whole flow chart in my mind. If I do this and the world will come to an end and if I do this everything is great. So how do you balance that uh, in terms of the thought process? So I, I heard this quote from my friend. I was just on his podcast called Overcome. And he said to me, we've all, we've all overcome 100% of our worst days, right? I mean, it's pretty fair to say that. We're here, we're alive. We've overcome 100% of our worst days. I'm just like you. I, I mean, I'm actually very much like this needs to make sense. I don't know if it's an Indian upbringing or whatever, but it's like this has to make sense, right? But my life has never made sense. If you look at my life, I'm a miracle. I could have died of a drug overdose. I could have done so many awful things and I didn't, and I'm alive. Um, I don't want you to go down that path, but what I'm, what my point is in trying to say this is like, I look at what I'm telling myself. It, it's usually fear of like doing something that's a little out of our comfort zone and we don't trust, but this is where I really do believe in a higher power. I do believe in a God. I do believe that there is something bigger than me that has always brought, like always had my back. It could have been way worse, right? So I would allow yourself to play a little bit, whatever that is, just be like, I'm just going to give it a shot. And you know what I, 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 I often do? I'll say to myself, what's the worst thing that can happen? I always just look at what's the absolute worst case scenario. And I'm like, okay, can I survive that? Would I be okay if that was the worst case? Yeah, most likely, yeah. I don't know what the situation is, but that's what I would do. Be like, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then also, this might sound a little dark. My biggest fear is having regret on my deathbed. So that always keeps things in perspective. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't ever want to regret because there's so much, you know, you know, so much of my life, I've seen things that I should have done that I didn't. So I, I'm just like, I don't want to live a life of regret, but whatever the thing is that you're thinking of, I would do that. Just really sit with it. And just also a lot of times when we're nervous to do something, it's actually excitement. You know, like even when I came up here and I was like, I'm actually not nervous. I'm just excited. I get so excited. I don't even know how to handle myself, you know? So I like need to have the clock and I'm just so excited to be here. Also just trust to like, trust that feeling in your body. Like your body will always speak the truth to you. Right. So just trust that and experiment. Just do it as a logical, ex- like use your logic. You're like, let's have this be an experiment. Let's just see what would happen if I just listen to my my body first, my intuition with, you know, with the situation or for whatever, you know? Thank you. Yeah, just give it a shot. You really have nothing to lose. Yeah, thank you. 
Any other questions? Anyone in the back? My sound guys? My movie guys? Yeah. Okay, cool. Is this from online? Okay, great. If work is home, then how do you keep yourself from becoming a workaholic and keep work from bleeding into your life outside of work? That's a great, great question. So as we looked at what home meant, home is a place within yourself where you are a gentle, you're using a gentle and curious approach. When I think about home, it's all these parts of yourself that make up your best self. So I don't want your work. For all my workaholics out there, I don't want you to like bring a sleeping bag and start sleeping here. What I want you to do is bring your best self to work. So like, you don't have to feel fragmented. Like, oh, I have a work self and then I have a home self. No, like be one of the same person, right? Like be that, be your best. Like, you know what it's like to put your best foot forward. Bring that best part of yourself into work. And I would say for those of you who maybe have a tendency to bring your home, home your, your work home with you, don't like, just don't do that. Like everything can wait, schedule stuff after work that you have to look forward to either with your colleagues or like go to a movie. I just went to a, a sing-along at Alamo Draft House for Greece. It was amazing. Like I just went by myself two Mondays ago. So like schedule, schedule stuff that doesn't have anything to do with work. Also, we live in a society where our worth is tied to our productivity. So just know that we've been programmed to think that if we relax that we're lazy or if we're not working that we're lazy. And it's just not true. If that's the case, I'm the laziest person alive and I'm doing great. So that's what I would say is just, I'm not, I'm not talking about have work be home, like camp out here. It's, you know, at home, I think we feel a lot more relaxed, right? We can be more of ourselves. And, you know, I, I think we see parts of ourselves that maybe we don't let other people see. Um, and we, we can allow people to see those parts of us and be more of ourselves and be our best selves at work. Thank you, Ms. Lane. Yeah. Any other questions? AV, yeah, any yeah. questions? <laughs> oh, he was going to stand up. Okay. Well, thank you for inspiring us. Thank you. And motivating us, not thank only you. in work, but in our personal lives. Of course. Um, we're so happy that you came to Indeed. I'm so happy. And I talked about it. your life experiences. I'm wearing sneakers. <laughs> I'm wearing sneakers. I, I mean, actually, Angela was like, yeah, we don't have a dress code. And I was like, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm not wearing heels ever. No, like I'm wearing my sneakers. Dress and sneakers are like the best. Yes. yes. Uh, Y'all are really lucky to work here. It's a great place. Yeah, were you going to ask something? No? <laughs> All right. And um, if there are any questions anymore, um, yeah. we'll go ahead and close today's presentation. Yeah. Um, Angela, Gabby, I don't know if there are any questions from you guys. I'm checking Slido. I'm here. Y'all can, if, if some of you're all shy, you can connect with me. Feel free to send me a DM. Um, you can also go to my website. Make sure you get on my book wait list for everyone watching remotely as well. My book will be coming out. Um, it's a big deal. I never thought, you know, someone who was diagnosed with a mental illness and was told like, I was gonna have to be on meds for the rest of my life and I'm not on meds, it's been three years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I never thought that I would be able to write a book and I did. So, you know, there you go, Big Pharma. When is your book coming out? Uh, when is your book coming out? It's coming out spring of 2023, but pre-orders will happen this year. So if you go to vasavikumar.com forward slash book, you can just get on my email list and you will be the first to know when pre-orders are available, Amazon, Barnes and Noble the whole nine. And I signed with a, um, a, a, a traditional publishing house. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big deal. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm getting my book. Yeah. Say it out loud. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.